Thanks for tuning in to RougeRadio.com, show 26 of 2012. Brought to you this week by Ketter.com, a new solution to your fence ideas. This week on CFL News, Jen talks with CFL.ca Grey Cup writer Matt Scanetti to recap divisional semifinals and preview division finals. This week on Canadian University Football News, Kevin talks with Andrew Wadden from Crown Canadian University Countdown to recap the weekend games. In Canadian Junior Football League news, Josh and John recap the national championship game and the league award winners. Show 26 kicks off. Hut, hut. Hey, you. Yeah, you with that sandpaper and paintbrush getting ready to sand and paint that wooden fence again this year. When you could be sitting back, relaxing on your patio, and watching your neighbors do that work. Get rid of that wood fence and easily install a new low-maintenance resin fence that lasts. Visit Keter.com, K-E-T-E-R.com, for videos, product information, and more. You can find this fence at some Costco's across North America, and always at costco.ca with shipping right to your door. Ketter.com. RougeRadio.com. Jen, wrapping up week one of the CFL playoffs with Matt Chedetti, who will be covering the Grey Cup for CFL.ca. Hi, Matt. Jen, I uh, I really wish we had a lot of exciting things to talk about because oh, this weekend was just so, so boring. This, these are perhaps the two most boring playoff games <laughs> I have ever watched. I, you know, I, I just woke up. I, ju- I just I just woke up. Actually, I'm 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 not joking. I just woke up. I I'm, <laughs> I'm still feeling a little groggy. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that uh, yeah, I know. I, I hate it when things all just, everything ends as planned, and you know the games just <laughs> go perfectly according to script. <laughs> yeah, I know those those games really bite. <laughs> yeah, no. This is uh, honestly, this was this this was. If you're a CFL fan, and even if you're not, this was this was a perfect week for the league to really just show. I think across the country, leading into the Grey Cup, listen, this is our brand. This is our kind of football, and uh, this is what exciting CFL can look like. Because it, I mean, those two games were just fantastic. The, the Calgary Saskatchewan game, whether or not you're a Rogers fan or not, was you know awesome. No, oh, if that. Harp, I mean, it, listen, you can't get to a point with the riders where you're going into, you know, the final 90 seconds with a lead and not get that ominous sense still. I mean, regardless of how well Bob Dice was able to just open up the Stampeders, you know, p- p- pick on Kenyon Raymond with, you know, really, really decisive uh, routes for, for Weston Dressler. He, you know, in the, in the first half and in the second half, he was the guy who helped get them down the field. And then, of course, you know, Greg Carr pitched in at the right times, and you know, Corey Sheets was leading the way in terms of scoring. But my goodness, I, I, I hope we talk about this a little bit more because I think it is a serious issue. Uh, to see two things: one, to see Huff, John Huffman be proved right that that Drew Tate is 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 a big game quarterback. I think should show a lot for Stan Peter fans about how great their future looks. But the fact is, is that Drew Tate might have all done this with a concussion, which I think opens up the discussion a little deeper uh, about, you know, what what the protocol is in the CFL. Because we've talked all this year about Buck Pierce and his quote unquote soft melon. You know, you know, Drew Tate got absolutely pulverized by Terrace George in the first quarter, and he got up holding his head, uh, and he even had his uh, his offensive lineman come over and, and, and talk to him. And he just kept rolling with the punches. But we'll be talking about it simply for one reason. He spoke to TSN's Farhan Longi right at uh, right at halftime and said at the end of his really short interview, and maybe it was a little flippant, but he went ahead and he said, "Listen, I can't remember the first quarter, and then or, or sorry, the first the half, first half. Uh, and yeah. then and then ran away." So. Uh, unbelievable performance by Drew Tate, but I think there are still a few, and there should be a few questions about, uh, you know, what, what if if indeed he was doing everything with an unclouded mind. Well, yeah, and that's that's the question: Was he doing it? Was he okay? You know, and should if he wasn't, should he have gone back in? Yeah. But yeah, speaking I mean, of quarterback injuries, um, <laughs> yeah, that that first game. Let's let's take it in turns. We'll start with the East. I'm very relieved to find out that apparently Matt Nichols has only suffered a dislocated ankle. Dislocated ankle. Yeah. No, it's. Uh, it looked a lot worse. 
I, I'm sure everyone who saw that immediately thought of, um, you know, what uh, Lawrence Taylor uh, looking or standing above Joe, Joe Theismann back in the 80s um, after Joe Theismann's leg basically, uh, you know, he had a compound fracture, uh, which ended his career, and and w- that all that that fright that basically uh, kind of just came over Lawrence Taylor's face uh, when when he looked at Joe Theismann. Uh, I think we all had that sensation when we saw, you know, Ronald Flemons. I don't think the Argos defensive end did it maliciously, but when he no. basically when, when he corralled uh, Matt Nichols, and just to see the way Matt Nichols, I mean, no leg, tw- a leg should never twist like that. That's just no. it, it was it was unnatural, and. I, on Twitter, I saw a bunch of people retweeting it. I didn't retweet it. I mean, I'm not trying to sound sanctimonious here, but there's no, there's no, need, there's to no, gawk need. At, there's no need to gawk at that. I mean, the man's leg was basically, you know, his, his knee was pointing, his knee was pointing north and his foot was pointing south. So it's, it's just, it's, it just doesn't make any sense. However, the great thing is, is that he's okay. He was, he was thankfully conscious and he was, you know, pretty receptive and, and 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 you know obviously acknowledged the crowd when he when he left, but uh, it was it was a scary moment. But I think what's even scarier is the rebuild job that this Eskimos team is going to have to go through. There are so many questions now. You think about sure if you if you if you maybe just watched the first quarter of this game and you found out that the Argos you know scored over 40 points, you might be incredibly shocked because the Eskimos did start the game very, very well, due in part to a, to an Argos team that started incredibly slowly. But as the game went on, and as you took into consideration some of the decisions Cavis Reed was making, some of the decisions uh, Kerry Joseph was making, and it, his season has been a tragedy, some of the decisions Corey Boyd made, you start to get a sense that this, uh, you know, when you look at Winnipeg, when you look at Hamilton, perhaps Edmonton is probably in a worse situation. Listen, J.C. Sherritt what, didn't play because he rolled his ankle in the, in, in the last game of the season. Uh, ironically enough, after he broke Calvin Siegel's, uh, uh tackle uh, record, which now brings into, which now bring Cavis Kav- Reed into the, into the conversation, well, why would you play him so he can just break a record and, and potentially get injured and not play in a much bigger game? Why was Corey Boyd playing uh, for most of the time ahead of Hugh Charles? You know, why... Maybe why did you start Kerry Joseph? Yes, he started hot, but most of his throws after the first quarter were just aimless and, and kind of all over the place. And he never really adjusted to the Argos to the Argos pressure game, which is, to be quite honest, I haven't seen the Argos apply that much pressure on a quarterback all season. So uh, to see how all the moving parts basically stopped on the Eskimos and how they all of a sudden look rusted and out of place and basically uh, unsalvageable really makes it, I think, uh, a very, very long and a very, very tough offseason upcoming for uh, head coach Cavis Reed and President Len Rhodes. Well, yeah, especially without a GM, too. So. Oh, yes. <laughs> There's that little minor detail, right? Well, you know, Cavis was basically doing, a, you know, if, if – if Terry Jones is to be believed, and and you know, we, you know, Terry Jones is a, obviously the venerable uh, columnist for the for the Edmonton Sun. If if he's to, if he's to be believed, then basically Cavis has been doing this all on his own for a very long time. So perhaps it was just a point of everybody just being so exhausted after what you know what was really not just a trying season, but a trying year ever since Ricky Ray uh, moved from Edmonton to Toronto. Yeah, um, and you know whether or not. You know, we can disagree about this or agree about the timing that there was a really bad sense of timing to do this <laughs> for going into a playoff game because there's no way that it's not a uh, distraction. But did Tillman deserve to leave? Possibly. Do I think that's why the Eskimos lost? No. No. No, I, I, and I agree. I mean, I think that whatever Eric Tillman did or did not do, I, I think – as much as people are calling out Cavis Reed, I think I, I think Cavis Reed tried to keep that as separated as he could. However, um, I think the consequence of some of Tillman's decisions, the long-term consequence of some of Tillman's decisions, namely, you know, perhaps not signing, not having, I guess, the the sense of security on his defense because a lot of those players, including J.C. Sherrod, haven't been signed. Um, uh, to see that co- an un- almost unworkable, almost confusing, altogether just, just uh, well, I guess there really is no other word to use but confusing running game. Um, and that quarterback situation will go ahead, and regardless of what accomplishments 
Eric Tillman has had that that quarterback situation that he left um I think will be a cause for concern regardless of how long it takes Matt Nichols to recover and it will take a long time it'll be a cause for concern for a while so I don't necessarily think that the Eskimos lost because Eric Tillman was fired but I do think that the long term con- I I think it was inevitable and the long term consequences of his decisions I think came really really became conspicuous in the defeat uh, definitely. Um, that's not to take anything away from the Argos, who had an awesome game. <clears throat> Much as I said about Chad Owens not being able to, having not scored um, a kick return touchdown all season. Yeah, you know what? The, 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 the great thing. <laughs> the, I mean, this is. I, I I'll put my hand up and I'll admit two things. One, I went ahead and I and I've been on the bandwagon of poking Chad, not every week and not incessantly, but periodically asking him, you know, does it bother you? Does it bother you? Does it bother you? Does it bother you? And to, to Chad's credit, he has gritted his teeth a bit and rolled his eyes a lot, but he's always been very tactful and diplomatic in his response, and that's usually been, listen, it, it's it's a it's a full complement of things that have to happen. It's not just me running, and it has to be like everything has to come together well. And there were there were a lot of good blocks in that return. But you know, the thing about Chad Owens is he's not Chris Williams. He, Chris Williams will 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 kind of run away. Um, from 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 tackles run away from run away from contact not because he's fearful of it but because you know he knows that people can't outrun him like he's he's so much faster than than the tacklers who might be pursuing him especially when they're occupied by by great blocks but the thing with Chad Owens is Chad Owens is is rugged and he's tough uh he's fast but you know he's the the, the speed is is more about what what happens at the point of impact and to see him run into tackles all year and not be able to break one, or or be as as Scott Milanovic has said, a shoelace away from breaking a few, I think has frustrated him. But you saw today that he found his hole when he needed it, and there were a couple of moments where it looked like he was going to fall on his face, and he just, out of pure determination, ran the the full of uh, that 55 or 56 yards, uh, and I really I think it was part of you know sparking that confidence in that Toronto team. And listen, um, we talked. Off air, Jen, just about a, a, a small story I wanted to share. Back in back in August, and the tape is the tape is online. Um, when the Argos were struggling, I think this might have been after the BC game, when uh, Lions coach Mike Benavides basically called the Argos the best team in the league, uh, and obviously uh, Scott Milanovic was was pretty flattered by that. But after the game, when the Argos when it was one of Ricky Ray's worst games, when the Argos gave up so many penalties, really, really frustrating penalties, I, I simply asked Scott, I mean, you know, how frustrating is it to see at this point that the team is still slowly adjusting, is still do, you know, is, is is still giving away frustrating penalties? Is is when it comes to the red zone, it's under forty percent. And he kept on looking at me, and he did it all throughout the whole year. And he kind of, again, gave me this kind of smirk where he was just like in his mind going, just shut up, Shinetti. I don't want to, I, you know, you're asking me the same questions all the time. But, you know, he, he said very, you know, very diplomatically then, listen, I want my team to be prepared for November. I think my team will be prepared for November. In fact, I know we'll be prepared for November. And I, you know, because I was being a smart ass, I said, well, he may not be playing in November. <laughs> And he kind of and he kind of looked at me and he said, "No, we will be playing. Yes, we will be playing in November." And he was absolutely right. And now, if, if I mean, there's nothing else. They had a regular season game November first. Well, yeah, I, I, I mean, that, really I mean, start that, out. Uh, if you want to try that, they had a regular season game November first. You know, I, and I think I, 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 I you know, I, I was looking to poke him that day, and and you know, but he 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 in the end, I was wrong, and and he was right. This team was incredibly prepared at the point that they needed to be. And it was showing through in that Hamilton game last week. And not necessarily the starters. We're talking about all the component pieces. You know, guys who weren't even playing together all looked prepared. Mentally, this team looked ready. In the first quarter, the Argos, you know, there's that Jordan Younger dropped interception. There's that uh, fumble by Jarius Jackson on the, on the second and short, which never happens, especially not with Jarius Jackson. You know, they just didn't seem to be in sync. Hugh Charles has a huge 46-yard run to set up uh, Kerry Koch's opening touchdown for the Eskimos, and you're thinking to yourself, wow, all week we've been we've been kind of hammering the Eskimos for what they're not prepared to do, and look at the Argos, not prepared at all. But you see Corey Boyd fumble that football, and you just see a sense of comfort come in. Ricky Ray now, uh, as, 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 as someone on the coaching staff told me uh, a couple weeks ago, now gets 
just how to shorten the field in Milanovic's offense, knows where all his options are, and it just seemed to be a very methodical thing. When you score 31 points in, in, in one quarter, um, uh, you know, obviously one off of a, you know, a great, great turnover from, from Marcus Ball caused by Brandon Isaac, you get a sense that this team is starting to work uh, not only offensively but defensively as well, that this team is starting to work in every facet. And that's what Milanovic had said, that he had had at no point this season seen all three phases work together. And they had all worked together in that second in that second quarter. It doesn't matter if you're the BC Lions or the Hamilton Tire Cats. The way the Argos played in that second quarter, they would beat any team in this league handily. The, but the issue is, is maintaining that consistency, and I'm sure that's one of the things that um, Milanovic is going to be working on this week going into Montreal because it's a different kind of team and it's a different kind of environment. First of all, Milanovic knows how loud it gets in the Olympic Stadium, especially if, you know, it is to be expected that there will be, you know, 40, you know, upwards in the high 40,000, maybe 50,000 people there. Um, that it's it's going to be loud and traditionally, as you all know, Jen, when the Argos have gone and passed these finals to Montreal, they haven't played well at all. Um, so this is going to be a, a, a really strong test for what is still a very young team. But to that, in that second quarter, um, you know, offensively, Ricky Ray, Ricky Ray trusting his receivers, Maurice Mann being able to break more yards off of contact, that defense pressuring uh, Kerry Joseph more than it had pressured any other quarterback this season, to see Brandon Isaac get the right kind of pressure, not, you know, even though he had a horse collar tackle in the first quarter, but to see him go in and cause – um, Kerry Joseph to 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 maybe go for a, a rather silly choice of, of throwing what was didn't even look like a shallow pass kind of just looked like he was just you know tossing the ball from his from his hip pocket right into the hands of Marcus Ball who knew where he needed to be to kind of maybe provoke that turnover that just shows a, a sense of pressure and and overall confidence in the defense. But really, overall, that, that, that key word has to be trust with this team. They trust each other now, and going in the East final, you, that's, I think, the quality that they need to succeed. I, I, I definitely agree. Um, you know, we talked a bit about the, I mean, the loss of Gessel's backup quarterback, and that wouldn't have been an issue had their starting quarterback been able to play or had a good game, I guess, is the correct uh, comment. The question is, were they right to start? Yeah, listen, I mean, did you, <laughs> like, the, that's the problem. You have Kerry Joseph, you have Stephen Giles. I don't know that. Would you want to start at either of them? Well, here's the thing. I mean, it, you had two very, you had two very different situations um, for for both the Alberta teams. Um, Listen, I, I I was on the boat regardless of what Drew Tate was able to to accomplish this weekend. I thought that Kevin Glenn deserved to start because he had done all season what was expected of him when he was when he when he was brought over in the trade that sent Henry Burris to Hamilton, which is he come he would come in as that veteran veteran presence that really um, calm and and bring a sense of 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 just just well calm and 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 structure to the offense, and that's what he was able to do. On the flip side. In, in Edmonton, you see Kerry, you, you see first Stephen Giles come in, and regardless of Cavis Reed saying that he had a, a package set up for, for Stephen Giles, the package was simply put your helmet on and stay on the sidelines, because Stephen Giles, regardless of what you may think of him as an overall athlete, I don't think is a very good CFL quarterback. I said this when the Ricky Ray trade happened, that Stephen Giles cannot succeed in Edmonton, because Stephen Giles has not played a full season anywhere in the CFL, of all, with all the teams that he's played on. But Cavis Reed, you know, when you take a look at the only two options that he really had, Kerry Joseph and Matt Nichols, you're either going to put your trust in Kerry Joseph, who, although TSN was saying that he had a 4-1 and record, the best record of any active quarterback uh, in the playoffs, including a Grey Cup, uh, to say that I think was, was reaching a little bit. Kerry Joseph, for the most part, has been someone who's just kind of mitigated maybe some of the the, the obvious um, blemishes in in this offense. It's not a very good offense. There's depth there. There's obvious depth there, particularly in receiver. But the execution has just been all over the place. Um, I still don't know at this point who who, who exactly was call, calling the plays on a consistent basis. Matt Nichols has come in the last couple of weeks. Um, you know, first. Uh, 
in that in in that Montreal game and 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 really I think showed a lot of people that he has the potential and that's great to see and he showed it again last week uh, against Calgary but the, but the, but the fact still remains is that would you want it's it literally was they had no option whereas John Huffnagel could go ahead and say you know what I trust Drew Tape because I'm sure that 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 I, I, he is he's my guy because I see the talent there he's proven to me that the talent's there and if he, if it doesn't work I've got a I've got a solid backup pe- uh, plan in Kevin Glenn and I can take that risk. Cavis Reed was in an untenable position. It was either I'm going to throw a kid in and then I'm going to throw a veteran in cold and cross my fingers, or I'm going to throw a veteran in whose arm is who whose arm strength seems to be diminishing week to week, and a kid who, although sure he's he, he's maybe held uh, held his own and helped us come in to to maybe complete some near comebacks, is still a kid, is still 25 years old in a, in a league in a game that he's still trying to grasp. You know, this is the second time Matt Nichols has come in. People will remember he's come in this season and been injured. He came in in Hamilton uh, and left the game after sustaining what was probably a concussion after trying to tackle head first uh, after he collided with, I think it was either Ray Williams or Jamal Johnson. This time it's it's a horrific, horrific injury that's none of his fault. You know, you can't just go ahead and throw your rookies out to, to, to the dogs like that, especially especially someone like Matt Nichols who, you know, for all intents and purposes, when he's played this 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 year, it's only been out of desperation because the Eskimos have had nobody else. Right, and I mean, if he is in fact your quarterback of the future, you also don't want to be risking him, um, you know, in ways where he keeps getting drilled. And uh, I mean, it raises the questions too about the Eskimos' offensive line because everybody was under pressure. Um, oh, There's no doubt about that. Like it's, it's. Do you really want to put a, a, a young quarterback in when you have such a questionable offensive line? Yeah, I mean, again, we, we, we come to the point where we're going to have to be talking quite, uh, or not we, excuse me, where Len Rhodes is going to have to be talking. I mean, we, I mean, they'll be doubtlessly, um, you know, John McCrennan and, and, and Terry Jones, uh, McCrennan with the, with the Edmonton Journal and Jones with the Edmonton Sun, will doubtlessly be talking about breaking down every part of this Eskimo, uh, of, this, of this complete Eskimo problem throughout the year, but throughout the, throughout the offseason, I should say. But, you know, that offensive line, uh, I think not only that, but it's it's the offensive line, and then the blocking that 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 wasn't there from from not just Corey, but you know what, we want to just pick on him uh, alone, but from the running game, um, just the receivers and their relationship with the quarterback. Because remember, the fact is, is when you constantly change quarterbacks, as Edmonton, uh, I don't have the stat if they if they change the most often this year, because obviously Winnipeg had their own kind of carousel as well, but. When you have a quarterback coming in and constantly change, when you're constantly changing under center, the receivers really can't get their timing down. They can't get that relationship. They don't know when to cut their routes. They don't know where they have to be to, for for that kind of um, not just the you know the point of contact with with the defensive backs, but also you know knowing where they have to cut for to to be able to receive the ball. I mean, there are so many little little details that go into having a quarterback there and having a, having a regular quarterback there to to think in this situation that you were going to throw either Kerry Joe of and or Matt Nichols, particularly Matt Nichols, into the situation, and think that all of a sudden, in a, in a playoff situation against an Argo team that was peaking at the right time, uh, that that either Nichols or Joseph was going to all of a sudden just uh, develop a, a sense of chemistry with a with a football team that's only won two, I think, of their last nine or ten games. I think is a little absurd, and I and I'm sure at the end of the day, and there were constant images on Twitter of, of it, but to see that pinched look on. On on Cavis Reed's face, I think really show really paints a picture of this entire season, which was there was no hope um, to begin with, and at the end, there's only now a, a lot of problems and a lot of questions. One of the other issues with the Eskimos, I think, is that they don't have a lot of draft picks. Rebuilding in the CFL is very hard without a good draft, so it's gonna it's gonna take some time. It, was this the coming like the big coming out party that everyone in Toronto has been waiting for for Ricky Ray? You know what? I think we've seen. I think we've seen over the last couple of weeks. And I asked Milanovic this. So when I was at Argos practice, I said, "Do you feel so much better now, knowing that you have uh, a, a confident and really not just confident, but almost I won't I won't say cocky Ricky Ray because that sounds like an absurd thing to think that Ricky Ray that that quiet and bashful Ricky Ray is cocky, but there's just such a just such a strong aura about him now. I mean, my goodness, Ricky Ray was so was so excited after. Scoring that touchdown at the end of the se- uh, end of the uh, end of the first half, that he did a jump spike, which is something you'd never see uh, you'd never see him do. But um, 
you know, he said, absolutely. I can see now. I know now where Ricky is at. I know where his head is at. I know what he likes and what he doesn't like. He knows what I like and what I don't like. We've heard endlessly the stat that going into the playoffs, he had eight touchdowns and only one reception and nearly six, or sorry, nearly 700 yards passing. But all that stuff is, is almost superfluous to the fact that you look at the way, and I go back to that word trust, you look at the way that Ricky is, is dropping the ball down to Maurice Mann, who was someone who everyone expected that he would have a strong relationship with. Jason Barnes, who was you know kind of oscillated with Mann a little bit and, and didn't maybe have the kind of impact he'd had in, in previous games, particularly that game a couple weeks ago against Winnipeg, but also Chad Cacker, obviously Chad Owens. Um, and, and you get this sense that Ricky not only feels comfortable with himself in the offense, but where all his pieces are. Um, you like to say it's, it was a big coming out party, but... You know, unfortunately, and this will this will be part of the narrative, even though it shouldn't be. Um, there wasn't a huge crowd there to to see him um, really perform. I think, and this whole Argos team perform at their peak uh, and and have their best quarter literally of of the whole season when they needed to. But for Ricky Ray, I think it's it's a sense of relaxation knowing that. Not only does he get the offense, not only is he connecting with his receivers, but he is now, after two losses this year, he now has a great bugaboo off his back. He no longer has to think about the Edmonton Eskimos anymore. Yeah. No one is going. No one's going to ask him about well, how does it feel to be in Toronto. I know he probably answered it for the last time on TSN right after the game, saying. Well, how does it feel to beat your old team? Well, it feels bloody great. Of course it feels great. Like it, it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's like that's the most obvious, but it's deeper than that for Ricky because when I asked him at the beginning of the season how much it bugged him to have to move across country, to have to learn a completely, completely new offense and have to go ahead and, and basically – almost prove himself again. He 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 went in he he went out of his way to say I haven't done anything yet. I really need time. I haven't done anything yet. Now there's this sense that not only does not only does he think that he has the time, he thinks he can do it now. And you going into next week, going into Montreal, regardless of Jamel Richardson and, and Victor Anderson and um Shea Emery and Chip Cox and Teresa Bear and of course Anthony Calvillo. I still think that at this point, I'm not betting against Ricky Ray. The question is, like, it to me, it's looking like the Argos are now the real deal, and I'm, I'm sure I'm going to get laughed at for this, but I think they could, you know, I honestly think that they have a solid chance of beating the Montreal Alouettes next weekend. Before, I wouldn't have said that, especially given that out of their last four games at home, they lost three of them horribly. And not horribly as in they were lopsided, but horribly as in they were just god awful games to watch. I think um, what you I think what you Hamilton gonna... was good, but that was the only, you know, and then I kind of can't blame Toronto fans for not necessarily all coming out. It was I mean, the, apparently the construction around between construction on every street you could possibly use to get into the to the Rogers Center area and then apparently a movie shoot that closed down three other streets that you might have wanted to use. It's not exactly easy and Somebody said Toronto fans don't know what to do with a playoff team. Well, listen, they're, 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 listen. I, I mean, they, I, I heard those. I heard that too. Um, and I'm not trying to go ahead and 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 wag my finger at uh, at you or a lot of really really passionate CFL fans. But the, the the fact is, in this city, if 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 there's a winner in this city and there's a winner to gravitate to, people in Toronto will come from all over the place. I mean, my goodness, people still come, and I know this for a fact. When their Leafs are on, regardless of how bad the team is people still come from from way outside the city and still take hours and hours to get here to get there and to, to, to get there and that was the case for toronto fc until people started to realize that toronto fc was was nothing but uh <laughs> was nothing but a logo and 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 a couple of really expensive beers and and maybe a good time if, if you were drunk but the fact is is that <laughs> at the end of the day um Ricky Ray has now, I think, after this game, become the face of this franchise. He was it was forced upon him before. I think now, with the way that, I'm, and I'm not saying that Ricky Ray is all of a sudden going to be, you know, a, 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 an almost like because of the documentaries coming up, a, a Joe Theismann kind of character with the Argos, like the way Theismann was back in the back in the '70s, where you know he and that fairly young Argos team were were kind of you know they they they, they brought they brought together a fairly young demographic in the city. No, I'm not going to say that. I, I listen. I, I I'm not going to prognosticate or predict what what will happen if if, if Toronto does beat 
Um, Montreal, all I'm going to say is this. Can they beat Montreal? Yes. And the reason they can beat Montreal is simply that Ricky Ray now not only believes in this team, but he believes in him, in himself as a part of this team. Because I've seen Ricky up close, and I've talked to him face-to-face, and I've seen him frustrated throughout, the, throughout this season. Um, even from a distance, when he wasn't talking to the media, when he wasn't, um, uh, when he wasn't a part of it during those losses, when, when, and there's, it's not on Jarius Jackson, but during those losses when the team, quite frankly, when they, when they, lost, six of, when they lost five of six, people conveniently forget that when, when, it's all, when it's all glossed over with a big playoff win. When this team was five of six, you know, Ricky Ray kind of looked like a, a part, a, not a part of, but a part removed from this team. Now that he's playing um, as well as he is, I think that uh, the Argos not only have a good chance, they have a great chance of, of, of beating Montreal because Ricky Ray now feels confident as being, a, as being a leader of the Toronto Argonauts. And that's what the Argos have been missing. I mean, truthfully, they have not had a str- I mean. You could argue that Damon Allen, when he was back, there was a couple of years where he was almost a great—he was a great leader, but the team wasn't perfect around him. But really, since you know, another quarterback that you know the Argos got as a later in his career quarterback, Doug Flutie, was the last time you you had an Argo quarterback that everybody could kind of gravitate towards as a true leader of the team. Yeah, and, and you know the thing about here here are two things about I mean, the thing that makes Ricky different from Damon Allen. And Doug Flutie is that Damon Allen was forty when, or, or he was thirty nine forty when he won the Grey Cup, which is, which is a fantastic thing. And the next year he wins MOP, and and that and that was and that was great. Doug Flutie, with all due respect to um, to that great, and that you know everyone considers that that ninety six ninety seven those two Grey Cup winning teams as being quite 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 honestly among one of the best teams in CFL history. Doug Flutie was looking for one more chance at the NFL. Ricky Ray has had his chance at the NFL, and he's not he's not turning 40 anytime soon. He's 33 years old, and he doesn't have, regardless of whatever what happened to his knee, he seemed, I mean, my my goodness, he ran, the, the way he ran, strong as he did, he had him running head first, and he had no yeah. fear going in for that touchdown. And I'm sure, I'm sure, and it was in the back of my mind, when he did that jump spike at the uh, at, oh. at halftime, every, I think everyone was thinking, please don't land on your left knee, like, you know, yeah. it's, you know, I, 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 again, it's that confidence, it's that trust, and that's really important. And I don't mean to overstate it, but it's a big, it's a big deal because, as, as everyone was saying, and it's, it's, it's a, it's a perfect point. Not only was it a good day for the Toronto Argonauts, not only was it a good day for Ricky Ray, but it's a good day for the CFL because, like it, like it or not, um, the CFL, the, the C, Toronto matters to the CFL, and in a way, um, you know, uh, the, the CFL matters to Toronto in a very, in, in a very, very strange way. Um, and, and, and I don't mean strange as in like um, terrible. I mean strange as in like uh, the, 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 this relationship that 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 seems to be uh, unrequited. And we'll, we'll, you know, we'll see if Ricky can can really seize momentum if this team can continue to trust itself and they get to the Grey Cup. Hopefully that'll be a maybe maybe not the not the unbelievable Rogership moment we've been we've been waiting for to see you know thirty five forty thousand people come back to the Rogers Center to watch Argo games. But maybe it'll be an indication win or lose in that big game that this is a team that that at least in the present that uh, Toronto fans can get around because. Remember that place might be a, a like a concrete cavernous pile that Rogers Center, but when it's filled with people, it is an amazing sight. So it's still a ways away, but to see Ricky Ray enjoying himself, I think, is should be a great indication and a great and a great sign for every football fan, every CFL fan in this city. Yeah, and I mean, to the to the Eskimo fan, I know it has to hurt watching your quarterback or your former quarterback now, you know, beat you. It, it's never. You know, it's all, and a lot of us fans are still very upset about that trade, and rightly or wrongly, um, you know, it there was a trade. Um, but there was another kind of player coming back to Toronto. It wasn't just Stephen Giles. Was this Corey Boyd's last game? You know what? I'll have to say yes. I don't know how Corey Boyd comes out back after this game. Um, I'm I'm still will, I'm I'm still here to see uh, what he what he told the media. I remember talking to Corey at the at the, right after the BC game. The the game obviously inf, in, in, the game's infamous because he finished that week at, as as top as the top CFL rusher, and then okay. two days and then two days later was released. Um, 
But you think about all the things that happen to Corey. He starts to fumble at the end of the first quarter that basically ignites the Argos' unbelievable second quarter. Um, he's caught offside uh, in, in a really crucial, right after the Argos score a touchdown, he's caught offside, which would basically kills uh, an Edmonton drive. He uh, is tackled for a loss. I think he was tackled for a loss by Pat Watkins, the, corner, the Argos cornerback. And then... Most of the time in the second half, he's not going. He's not setting up in the right direction. He's not his blocks. He's not executing his blocks properly, and he's not where he needs to be. His routes. He, he's basically confusing his routes. I'm not going to psychoanalyze Corey Boyd because I don't have that degree. But the <laughs> fact is, is that this is a man who, to say his to say his confidence has been shot. No matter how much he might tell you that he's blessed and gifted always, which is something he loves to say. <laughs> the fact is, the fact is, this man has been broken. This is this is, this season has likely broken him. And I and I and I know, and I've spoken to Corey a few times. He's a very strong individual, um, and he believes in himself, or at least he puts on the front that he does. The fact is, is I I am not sure that another CFL team is going to believe in him because if you look at the situations across the country, you look at you look at Montreal. Okay, um, you know. It, what they have there already is 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 fine, and the fact is is that whoever they have back there it doesn't matter because their your your job as the running back for for the Montreal Alouettes is two things: one, don't fumble the ball, and two, make sure you're an extra blocker for Anthony Calvillo. Uh, in Hamilton, yeah, you know Siobhan Walker had a tough season, and Avon Coburn probably won't be back, but. Uh, there's still, you know, there there is enough depth there that I think that you know Siobhan Walker will be back, and I think he'll have a much better season because he'll get more reps. Um, I, 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 he, I, I would be surprised if he somehow found his way back to Toronto, especially the fact that Chad Cackert had 140 yards from scrimmage and Winnipeg for all of Joe Mack's faults. Um, you know, Chris Garrett, Chris Garrett's Achilles injury was kind of put on the waist it was kind of conveniently forgotten this year because Chad Simpson came in uh, just like Chris Garrett did after Fred Reed was injured and basically just proved that uh, whatever you want to say about Joe Mack you can at least find depth in, in a couple skilled positions you know Edmonton again won't have him back BC uh, Andrew Harris uh, Calgary has John Cornish um, Saskatchewan has Corey Sheets I mean where is Corey Boyd going to go and that I think is I think that is the that is the that is the frustrating thing because again, you look at the previous two years, twenty five twenty five hundred yards, which was a fantastic accomplishment. But the fact is, unfortunately the Argos passed him by. This was no longer going to be a running team. The Argos led the league in rushing but in, in rushing average the last two years. This was no longer being gonna be a team that basically pounded the ball on the ground. This was going to be a team that was all about Ricky Ray, and if if you to, if you are to believe what what Jim Barker and particularly what Scott Milanovic has said, at the end of the day, Corey Boyd just didn't understand that. Not because Corey Boyd is a terrible person, not because Corey Boyd is selfish, not because he's a terrible teammate. Even though a very good friend of mine, Rob Murphy, might go ahead and tell you that, but the fact of the matter is that Corey Boyd just didn't adjust the way he needed to. He didn't pick up his blocking schemes when he needed to. I mean, the, the, there have been countless examples of that shown. Um, he, he, he wasn't as good as he needed to be catching balls out of the backfield. And really, besides a really, really strong game against the Hamilton Tiger Cats in week three or four, if I, if I remember correctly, um, his season was with the Argos subpar. So all those things considered, and then obviously the, what the frustrating thing that happened with that with that triple-headed monster or whatever they tried to, with whatever they tried to use in Edmonton, it just didn't work out. And at the end of the day, Corey Boyd's career is the thing that's going to suffer. Yeah, and it, I mean it's hard because you don't want to see anybody fail. I mean, at least I don't want to see anybody fail. Like the league is small, and there's not. I mean, there's not a lot. The, you're right. There's nowhere to put them, and that's yeah. the unfortunate part. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe someone will uh, take a chance. Maybe, maybe someone will take a chance. I, I'd like. I maybe I'd like to think that, but okay. You, I don't necessarily think that. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that Brandon Whitaker in Montreal is going to be healthy by next year, um, and Victor Anderson has already shown that he can be a, a very good um, kind of deputy for uh, even, even though he himself has been injured throughout this year. But when you look at all the situations, I don't know if Jim Pop 
uh, wants that kind of uh, of insurance policy with insurance policy with Corey Boyd because really that's the only situation I could see him in. And again, what they would need him to do, he wouldn't be able to do. So, you know, I I I think that it might be the last time we've seen Corey Boyd play in in the CFL. I don't know if he would get a chance in the NFL. I, I you know not on not on the body of work from this season. So, um, but you never say never. Not in this league. Not in no. this league. You can't say you can't say never. You can't go ahead and you know what Corey Boyd is going to be spending the rest of his life as uh, you know trying to promote his 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 uh, personal training um, business, which he which he supposedly has been as has been doing quite uh, quite vigorously, or he he was in Argos practice. But the fact of the matter is, is that this is not a terrible guy. Corey Boyd is not is nothing but uh, by all accounts and every interaction I've had with him, nothing but an, uh, an upstanding guy and a, and a and a and a very good teammate from on the surface. I know there have been stories that have come up, come up that um, you know have and haven't been published, and I won't dabble into that because I don't believe in unsubstantiated uh, unsub- things that are un- unsubstantiated. But the fact of the matter is, is that Corey Boyd's career suffered, and clearly his confidence suffered. And the, I think the unfortunate image of him just standing on the sidelines with his head tilted, kind of this uh, um, this very forlorn and pinched expression on his face, uh, really painted a picture of his entire season. You mentioned John Cornish and, and the Calgary St. Peters as a team that you know doesn't necessarily need another running back. In fact, he's actually had a bunch of them over the course of the season. So, so on to the Western final. John Carter, how, how do I not how do I not bring up I don't know unintentional moon? Yeah, I mean, it, and his pants fell against, like you know. I, but I don't. I, it it just did not seem like the kind of it, it didn't seem like he was trying to do it on purpose this time. No, it's it. <laughs> As a joke. Which is even, which makes it even more amusing, yeah. at least to me. As, as it's funny you should say that because we, uh, a couple of, I think about an hour before, I think it was sometime midway through the second quarter, there were um, there was discussion. Rod Black was just having a discussion with Dwayne Ford about how John Cornish never uh, never adjusts um, his, his his attire for games. He cold weather, hot weather, wears the same gloves, wears the same this, wears the same that. You're kind of thinking to yourself, maybe this dude should invest in a, in a tighter pair of pants because clearly the ones he has aren't working for him. Um, clearly too big but, for him. And, 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 and the way he, and you know, all jokes aside, um, this is, uh, whatever you think of John Cornish as a, as, as, as a person, and I know writer fans don't think very highly of John Cornish. I've, I've met John and, and, and John and I get along pretty well. Um, you uh, can't, gee, you can't. I can't understand why. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really? Uh, two, I mean, two geeks talking about <laughs> like football and a bunch of yeah. No, gee, Matt, no, I no, can't yeah, understand yeah, why yeah, you and John Carter were getting along. Yeah, you know, you know, I, I you know, if, uh, shameless self promotion. If you, if anyone hasn't read my. Uh, my, my piece with John about playing video games with Peter Dyakowski, please do, because then you'll realize why I get along so well with John Cornett. But <laughs> It was um, one of your best articles ever, and well, I still giggle thinking of some of the comments um, there. You know, whatever you, want to, whatever you want to say about John Cornish as a person, I think he and Andrew Harris have really ushered in uh, a new era of Canadians in skilled positions. But the fact is that the West, that the West semifinal was not about him. It was entirely about Drew Tate. Uh, again, just looking at his numbers now, he nearly throws. Well, not nearly. He has about 363. Um, well, 300, I think exactly 363 yards. Yeah, it's, 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 so just yeah, 363 yards and about two touchdowns. Darren Durant, I got my, my my numbers mixed up. He was the one who threw for for, for, for touchdowns and, and over 400 yards before, but still. I didn't think that Drew. Uh, I know that the TSM panel had 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 tried to make their arguments, um, particularly Matt Dunnigan, who who went ahead and said, "Listen, um, you know, thanks Kevin Glenn, but Drew Tate's our guy." You know, Drew Tate, in my mind, didn't deserve to play. Um, and no disrespect to John Huffnagel and his Super Bowl and Grey Cup rings, <laughs> but you know, if you rely on a guy to win ten games for you and to lead you in the playoffs, he's the guy who should start in the playoffs. But evidently. John Huffnagel is a more intelligent man, obviously, than I am. Just to see Tate go out there and do the two things that, that Huffnagel said he would do, which is A, extend plays by being athletic, and B, bring an intensity that was infectious, I think I think shows that this Calgary Stampeder team is not going to simply go into BC place and cower against the uh, the BC Lions. Um, well, that, that game, by the way, is going to be... You know who could have asked for two better, two better division finals. I mean that they're they're just going to be spectacular. But um, 
Yeah, this, this really was, if you want to talk about a coming out party for anybody today, this I think really was Drew Tate's coming out party. But again, I'm still on the side that he may, he probably should not have played if he really was not, you know, if he really doesn't remember what happened in the first half. I mean, Terry George's hit on him uh, was pretty much a blatant helmet to helmet. And when yeah. you get up, when you get up, and if you're holding your helmet the way that um, Drew Tate was holding his helmet, he was probably hearing the bells of Notre Dame in his ears. Um, if that pretty much tells me that you know something's probably not going going right upstairs, but the fact of the matter is is that he came out and he performed. I don't know what that what the league is going to do about his comments to TSN at halftime, but they should look into it. But regardless, this just shows you that there is a, com- a tremendous amount of trust that Calgary, that John Huffnagel in particular, has in Drew Tate. That he basically has saw something last year in that Argo game where where Drew Tate came in to replace Henry Burris, who at the time was being very bad. Hank, when he came in and replaced him, he basically I think proved to Huffnagel that he was ready, and he, that he has showed that even when he injured his non-throwing shoulder, and I think that has a lot to do with the dedication that Tate showed, in, Tate showed in trying to come back quick enough. All that to say, I think at the end of the day, this Calgary Stampeders team, with all of its with all of its parts, with all of its component parts, you know, Rombie Bryant, Mark A. McDaniel, Jabari Arthur had that first touchdown pass. Um, again, and Rene Paredes. I mean, we were talking so long about how Luka Kanji was the best kicker in the league for, for you know, because he was on that streak. But Rene Paredes kicked a 50-yard field goal into the wind before halftime. Yeah. Uh, Kenyon Raymond comes off the edge and blocks a, a, a point after attempt after you know the the, the Rough Riders who bought, who played an excellent game. Listen, Kenyon Raymond on the flip side did have a tough time against Weston Dressler. Weston Dressler had. A, uh, I think over uh, nearly 150, 150, 150 yards. Fifty yards, yeah. Uh, so it's you know he it's not like he had a terrible game. I mean, and Corey Sheets too. Corey Sheets had a, had a, had a great game as well. So it's not like Saskatchewan was terrible. The they just got out executed by Drew Tate and a receiving core and John Cornish who were just that much better. Um, and against now going into BC. <sighs> Even though the Lions have tried to do everything they can to to kind of mask whatever game plan they have, and they were, I think, rightfully reprimanded by the league for for not letting the press watch their practices, um, I think that that that's the kind of confidence builder you have. Remember, this is a team. Even though they didn't, even though Drew Tate didn't play the whole game, this was a, a Stan Peters team that beat the Lions. Although it was in Calgary, although it was cold, although the Lions may or may not want to have wanted to play when it was snowing, they still beat the Lions. They still destroyed a Lions team uh, in that first half. So it is, I think, it sets up for a great matchup because Drew Tate now, I think, has the complete belief in this team. And much like Ricky Ray, he has a complete belief in himself that he now can lead this team uh, to the Grey Cup. That's what's uh, t- so nicely about next week's games because really. Yeah, there has to be a slight edge for home field advantage, but you've got now got two quarterbacks who are just coming into their own with their teams coming in as the visiting quarterbacks, which is a very dangerous uh, combination. Right? If you've got a team that's A, just come off of a win, you've had a bye, sometimes you're a little bit slow coming off of the bye, and B, you've got this, these quarterbacks who have, have got this newfound confidence in themselves, that could be a very dangerous combination for both Montreal and B.C., Oh, there, there, there's no doubt about it. I mean, I know that BC will be the uh, slight favorite over Calgary, or maybe even a, a bigger favorite, depending on where, where all the injuries um, stack up and you know what what happens to Tate throughout the week. But you know, overall, this uh, there, there's absolutely no way that you can discount now Calgary. You can't go ahead and say that they're going into BC place, regardless of how many people there, or as as the joke goes, whether the natural or uh, or constructed sound is it will will go ahead and 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 throw them off. I mean, this is still I think a supremely confident Calgary team, and and overall, I mean, you look at that Montreal Toronto match, and quite frankly, I don't I don't trust a Jeff Reinbold defense. I don't trust a Jeff Jeff Rein, I don't trust players uh, coached by Jeff Reinbold. Not necessarily because I think Jeff Reinbold's a terrible coach. He's just you don't know what you're going to get. You can flip a coin. You can get. You can get you know Dwight Anderson and um, Kyrie Say Bear playing unbelievable defense and stopping every ball that's thrown their way in the secondary, or you can get a, a team that basically just opens up wide and just allows anything to happen. I mean, remember before this before the second quarter, Ricky Ray's best quarter was against Montreal in Montreal in July, where where um, 
uh, again, I, I think it was, I think Chad Owens had two touchdowns in the first half, and Ricky Ray was basically just slicing open the Alouettes. He got shut down in the second half, yes, but I think that was one of the first indications that Ricky Ray was really starting to, at, at least he wasn't going to be um, somehow incompetent in, in, in the Argos offense, even though that just sounds absurd to say, but that was his best half, I think, apart from what he was able to do towards the end of the season and going into going into the playoffs or in the playoffs. Although the, the ultimate variable with this with the Alouettes is Anthony Calvillo. He's 40 years old. He just came off uh, his seventh season throwing 5,000 yards. And regardless of the injuries that he has in his receiving core, he is still the he is still the league's best quarterback, uh, excluding maybe one and one a with uh, with Travis Lule. But you go in now and you just see that that matchup because remember and and those who those who will remember those great cups um will, will will remember them fondly one of the great matchups in the CFL at the turn of the new millennium was Ricky Ray versus Anthony Calvillo when it was the Montreal versus the Edmonton Eskimos and I think those three great cups so you really have now setting up for a, a, an unbelievable uh, east final which I can't call right now if you ask me who's going to win I I couldn't tell you this is something that's going to yeah. I'd put the coin. To, yeah, you, you're just going to have to look at how the injuries stack up, look at what both teams are saying, and then basically, as you said, take a coin and take that, I guess, that um, that, that, that 100th Great Cup loony or, or 100th Great Cup coin and just flip it and say, you know, who, who, whatever, who, who, whoever, you, whoever is going to be head with the, uh, with the trophy is going to win the game because this is, um, this is an incredibly tough game to watch. But, to, again, just two amazing finals set up for next week. I mean, I, I, I really can't wait for it. It's going to be a great game. I'm looking forward to it, not just as an Argo fan. You know, I'm just looking forward to a good game of football. And, you know, I had no horse in the race for the Calgary Saskatchewan thing. I, you know, despite what some people may think, I don't have it out for the riders. Yes, yeah, sometimes I get annoyed with the, the sea of green. It was a great, exciting football game. I wouldn't mind not so exciting. You know, if the Argos game happened to be a blow in favor of the Argos, I would be perfectly happy with that for next week. But a good, exciting football game is all I'm really asking for. Yeah, no, I, and and I think we're I, I think we're definitely going to get that, and uh, I definitely think that maybe maybe perhaps we'll get uh, you know because you know as a as a writer you're you're a little selfish with uh, with those really really rich narratives. Maybe we'll get a situation like we did uh, in the 2005 Grey Cup. You know, the last time that uh, last time the big game went into overtime. Maybe we'll get one of those situations, or maybe hopefully we'll get uh, we'll get a a game that's very much the same like uh, that East semifinal. Between uh, Calvillo and, and 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 Kevin Glenn when he was still with Hamilton because that was an amazing game. But anyway, however it turns out, I mean, the, as much as we're, we're we're being a bit hyperbolic and talking it up, watch it become like a you know a twelve nine game. You know? <laughs> but either, either way, to to that was service right. You know, it's it's Calvillo still the best quarterback. Ricky Ray, I think, becoming. You know, I, I know some people will go ahead and say, "Well, you've been talking Ricky Ray up so much. Why would you say that Calvillo and Lule are still the best quarterbacks? Because they've been doing it all season. Ricky Ray has only really been crystallized as Ricky Ray, comfortable in this Toronto offense in the last month. So to see him maybe take another step, uh, to see him maybe you know have another three touchdown, four touchdown game, I think that would really go ahead and show that Ricky Ray is back to being the best quarterback in the CFL." we got to play the game, but I will be talking to you next week, and we'll, we'll see how everything wraps up. But, yeah, I'm not calling it. I'm not, I'm not even going to make a prediction for next week. I'm going to go through the whole week and not make a prediction. I'm just going to see how the game turns out. Yeah, good luck with that. I'm sure uh, <laughs> you and every other Argo fan is basically going to be dreaming of, uh, of seeing those Argos and, you know, something maybe akin to that 1991 East, uh, East Final against the Blue Bombers and that, oh. uh, you know, everyone, everyone always talks about the noise and the energy of that game. I remember that one. <laughs> I, I am sure – you will all be will be dreaming of uh, of that, and you know what? Maybe uh, maybe in a small way, maybe in a, um, not myself because I will I I I will always outwardly try to project some kind of you know objectivity. But I'm sure maybe there are a few uh, a few writers in the city who uh, who wouldn't mind seeing that too. Because in Toronto, as as much as a lot of other people might go ahead and 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 just turn their noses and go, who cares? Um, you know, this city is star for a winner, and uh, full credit to Scott Milanovic. He's really built a winner here, and uh, the dude really deserves to uh, maybe get a, a, a Coach of the Year nomination for this because it's, it's, to see this turnaround in, over the last year I think has been, uh, it's been pretty awesome.
this is when you want to go ahead and kind of soak in all the memories because uh, oh, yeah. you, don't get, you, be a, you don't get you don't get to the hundredth anniversary of something uh, just every year. No, and I have to. I mean, I was watching. I, I had the great fortune of watching. I was not at the dome either. I was watching the game um, at my local Legion with some eighty and ninety year old Argo fans, which was awesome. Ones who had been at the Mud Bowl and the Fog Bowl. Wow. So yeah, just hear just hearing the history of it was just phenomenal, and to see them jump up. And down when Chad Owens runs the ball back was better than any kind of win. Like literally jumping out of their seats. I think that's a I think that's a great way to close out. And and, and just as a side to uh, any uh, any of our veterans who might be uh, listening uh, listening to this podcast, uh, thank you very much for your service. And uh, I, I hope you did enjoy the uh, these fine CFL games on Remembrance Day. Thank you so much for wrapping up uh, the first week of. Ashton, and you know, we can't wait to to see you in a couple of weeks at the Grey Cup. Absolutely, Jen. Uh, it's always a pleasure talking to you, and we'll uh, talk to you next week. Football fans, and welcome to another edition of Rouge Radio. This is the CIS portion. I'm Kevin Garbuyo, joined by Andrew Wadden from Crown Canadian University Countdown. You can see that across the country on on your TV sets in most Western markets on Shaw and in the Kingston area on Kajiko. Andrew, thanks for joining us on this exciting time in CIS football. You know, if you add YouTube into that, we're actually worldwide at that point. We have some award winners announced across the board, and we'll get some predictions from you, Andrew. So starting off, we'll go with the big one, Heck Creighton. we got Kyle Graves from Acadia, the quarterback, Rotran Sene, the running back from Montreal, Kyle Quinlan, the quarterback from McMaster, and Eric Dzelwitzki, the quarterback from Calgary. Who do you have with that one? I think it's a slam dunk in everyone else's opinion. Yeah, but I'm going to give Eric Dzelwitzki his proper uh, pronunciation to his name. Oh, Everyone likes you. to butcher him. I know he's the uh, out here out west, so not everybody stays up uh, that late to watch the games and get it right. And I'll tell you what, you're not the only guy. TSN was butchering his name uh, last year. But this year, Rod Black and the boys seem to get it right. So Eric Dulesky, uh is not going to win the award, however. Uh, Rotran Sene, who I love, absolutely love Rotran the man. Gave him that na- nickname back, I think, in week six. He runs right over people. Fantastic running back. Kyle Graves, of course, in Acadia running that only good team that's in the AUS. However, it's Kyle Quinlan that's going to win the award. I mean, <laughs> what can you say? The kid's a stud. Uh, his statistics are just through the roof this year. Obviously, best team in the nation, uh, best player in the nation. And I, I'm going to say it on this week's show. Uh, I've said it before in the past. The kids got to get a sniff in the CFL. I'm sorry. I'm going to use this platform right now to say it because if he was out, or well, not healthy, but if he was able to play a full season last year, he would be back to back Heck right an award winner, not taking anything away from my boy Billy Green. But Billy knows himself that Quinlan is the man, best player in the nation, one of the best quarterbacks we've seen in Canada in a really long time. He's taking the heck. I have to agree with that one, and everyone else across the board seems to be agreeing with that. The President's Trophy for the Defensive Player of the Year nominees there are Brett Hubbard from X, Frederick Plessius from Laval. Amram Isho from McMaster, and Mike Adam from Calgary. Who do you got with that one? That one, I think Plessis has the hype going into it. Yeah, Plessis, uh, Isho, or Edom. I think those are the three. Uh, not, again, not taking anything away from Brett Hubbard, but, uh, you know, you can go with any of those guys. I'm going to go with Isho and McMaster. I really love his game. I love that McMaster defense. They're just you know, they get on people, and, and they don't think they get the credit they deserve at times because of the fact that they have so many offensive stars on that team. So I like Isho a lot. I've seen a lot of Edom. I've been uh, told tons about Edom uh, through my boy Jim Mullen, who does the Canada West Game of the Week on Shaw out in uh, Western Canada. Edom is a fantastic linebacker on a great defense in Calgary, but I'm going to go with Isho in this one, and I'm sticking with Mac. But that would be uh... – I believe the first time ever a team has had the Defense Player of the Year and the Heck Creighton Award winner, if that goes through. And a lot of people are predicting that to go through as well. Oh, absolutely. Look at the team, though. I mean, they're the monster they right are, now. You know, you got you got to play the monster if you if you want to if you want to win a win a Vanier Cup. I mean, uh, you know, Laval came close last year, but I mean, look at them now. They got so much swagger. The team's unbelievable, unreal talent on that team, and and I think coming up in this next award. 
uh, there'll be another guy from that same uh, uh, Crimson uh, McMaster squad, and uh, you can go ahead and introduce it, but I, I, I think I've already given away who I'm going to choose. The J.P. Metris Trophy for the outstanding down lineman, Rob Juvenville from the AUS, John Samuel Blanc from Montreal, the defensive end, Ben uh, Diaguillar from McMaster, and Brett Jones, a guard from Regina, and I think we know who you're going with. Well, I really like Brett Jones, though, and I have to say that Brett Jones is my second pick in this, and he's going to have himself uh, hopefully a good CFL career. He's one of the top prospects uh, going into the CFL draft. Uh, ben Diagular from McMaster, however, I mean, set the record this year uh, for sacks in a season. Of course, J.S. Blong from Montreal did tie him uh, late in the season, so they both – uh, I think it was 12 and a half is the record. Uh, but Ben had a fantastic year on, again, that amazing McMaster defense. So I, I just don't think they get enough recognition. I know people know they're good, but just with the amount of stars that they have on the offensive side of the ball, uh, they kind of get, you know, put down a little bit, but I would say, or not put down, but uh, maybe not talked about or given as much press clippings. But uh, Ben Diagler was my pick for uh, the Metris Award, and he had just a phenomenal year. And here we go, Mac, Mac, Mac with me so far. However, on this next one, uh, there is no Max, so I can't pick him. <laughs> <laughs> the Peter Gorman Trophy for Rookie of the Year. Thomas Troop running back out of Acadia. Shaquille Johnson, the wide receiver from McGill. Yannick Haru, the running back for Western. And Brett Blasco, the receiver from Calgary. Who do you have with that? Well, I just I wish I could say Haru because you know that's just a fantastic name. <laughs> However, uh, Thomas Troop is a guy that uh, at Acadia that had just a monstrous game, but he's not my pick. Shaquille Johnson is my pick for this one. Wide receiver Adam McGill, uh, my boy JP Schuare from Aquafoot.com raves about this kid, thinks he's just phenomenal, and he raves about McGill and, and the fact that he believes that they have a lot of talent and that they're going to be coming up in the next few years. Shaquille Johnson will be one of those guys that brings them up uh, and hopefully gets them you know, to a Dunsmore Cup and beyond. However, uh, right now at this time, he's still a rookie, and he's going to get my Peter Gorman Award this year, and he's got one of the badass names in the league. Anytime your name's Shaquille, I mean, you know, Shaq. I, mean, I know there's only one Shaq, but you know, I just love. I love. The, I love the fact that he's named Shaquille Johnson. That just to me, that sounds like a football player, and sounds like a wideout to me as well. Especially, and now the Rush Jackson Award. We've been <laughs> we joked about this before, Andrew. It's hard to have some insight because we don't really have too many transcripts. But Matt Albright <laughs> from St. Mary's, the alignment. <laughs> David Hadral, the receiver from Bishops. Zach. Andrew Shuck, a defensive back from Guelph, and Brett Jones from Regina, and you have a bit of an insight on Brett Jones, so I do. I, would, I, do. I think it's safe to go with him. I can't say anything about the other three because I have no idea how they do in the classroom. However, I do know how Brett Jones does because we had a fantastic feature uh, from Shaw uh, Regina on one of our CIS countdown shows, and I believe it was somewhere, uh, I don't know, week six or something like that, or episode six. You can go back and look on it on our YouTube page. Uh, but it was our Inside the CIS feature, and it was on Brett Jones and how he is basically you know, a phenomenal student, not only in the classroom but also on the field. Uh, so I know he's doing well in the, <laughs> in the classroom because I was told that from our good folks over at Shaw and Regina. So, yep, Brett Jones, you get my pick. And now the Coach of the Year, which is interesting this year because usually the Coach of the Year goes to the, uh, the team that goes defies expectations and surprises people. Well, when you're looking at the award nominees this year, Jeff Cummins from Acadia, Glenn Constantine from Laval, Stefan Patasic from McMaster, and Blake Neal from Calgary, those teams kind of lived up to their pub. You know what? I'm going off the board on this one. I'm, I'm not taking any of those guys. My pick this year, Stu Lang, Guelph. Look what he did with those Griffins. Inspired that team. Uh, Jazz Lindsay's just looking like he's going to be just a, an outstanding quarterback uh, moving forward. Was able to bring them to a Yates Cup, Yates Cup uh, final. The guy pays himself a dollar a year to coach this team. I mean, he don't need the money. He loves football. He loves the team. He loves the program. Uh, I, I'm taking Stu Lang this year. He, he's my pick, uh, Guelph Griffins. Sorry about all the other guys. I know they had a great year, and it's their – well, I mean, look at all that. Katie, Laval, McMaster, Calgary. I mean, it's, you know, it's last year all over again. So this year, I'm going with Stu Lang, off the board pick for mine, and uh, I know that it doesn't matter anyway because uh, no one listens to me. <laughs> but at least it – Stu Lang was getting a lot of pub before going into this, and with Patasic, a lot of people are just giving it to him because just to honor him for how he hasn't really stopped since 
last season they've been going, they've been rolling. Oh, and you know what though? I, I think they're, I think they're, I think they're afraid to not give <laughs> Patasic the nomination because he looks pissed off every game. Do you notice that when he's little score when they do the inside the locker room stuff and he's intense? He's one, of, you're one of his players. You're, you're, you're scared. You're nervous. You're like, damn, I can't lose this game. Coach is gonna rip my head off. So I think maybe <laughs> the people that take him the nominees are scared or something. They <laughs> want to give it to him or not give it to him because. You know, worried he might come looking for him. <laughs> the CIS is Nick Saban. Yeah. <laughs> Good one. Perfect. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we'll give you a suplex or something. I don't know. <laughs> now moving on to the games this week. We had the, the the best game I was watching for all of them was the Calgary-Regina game, and we'll start there. Close oh, come on. Start. Really? What? The best game? You, was... told me, you told me off air with the KDSMU. You were jacked for that game. No, you oh, we'll, get into the statistics. <laughs> we'll get to the statistics for that one in a bit. But Calgary, <laughs> Calgary, Regina, Calgary winning 38-14. A bit of espionage before the game. Andrew Buckholtz tweeted, uh, retweeted to one of the Calgary Suns reporters saying that the space heaters weren't working on the Regina sideline to start the game. Let us into that game and tell us about some of the frigid temperatures that they were dealing with there. Oh, well, I'm sure it was Andrew Buckholz's mustache that told all of us that, really. But I'll tell you what, because he does have a fantastic soup strainer, by the way, and that thing gets inside information. But, however, that's hey, that's what happens when you're on the road, right? You, you know, these things happen. Oh, sorry, the eaters are not working. I don't know. Road team, you're not getting them. Home team, we're getting them. Doesn't matter anyway. Calgary stayed hot throughout the game. Regina went ice cold in the third quarter. 27 unanswered points for the Dinos. I mean, they were just ridiculous. Uh, I'm, I'm actually quite disappointed in that game because I really wanted to see Mark Mueller, you know, just give it his all at the end. And I'm not saying that he didn't, but, I mean, just look at what happened in, in that game. I mean, they just fell apart, like I said, third quarter. Lambala, Hardy, Dulesky, they ran over the Rams. Hardy alone, 15 catches, Canada West record, 168 yards, but the guy still doesn't even score a touchdown. Lambala, 251 yards, 251 yards. I mean, come on, you're not going to win if you got a guy catching 15 balls and 168 yards and another guy rushing for 251. It's just ridiculous. Uh, I, I really wanted to see a better effort from the Rams out of that one. We didn't get it, unfortunately, and uh, those dinos are off. And it could be making a Vanier Cup. I mean, we'll see. And we'll get into that prediction a bit later. And now with the Yates Cup, McMaster winning 30-13. to The upstart Guelph Griffin's unable to come back in this one. McMaster just rolling through the OUA this year. Hey, you, you know, uh, inexperience is what it comes down to, in my opinion, for Guelph. Um, Jazz Lindsay, he had statistically a decent game, but then you have to put a big circle, a big red circle, uh, when you do his final analysis and report for the game and you look at those three interceptions. And that's the inexperience right there from a young quarterback. I mean, don't get me wrong. I think Jazz Lindsay is a fantastic talent. I think the Guelph Griffins are moving in the right direction, but you just, you're right up against the juggernaut. 20 straight CIS wins, uh, for Mac. Quinlan, 80% completion. I mean, Mac, or, or Quinlan, he didn't really dominate, like, no, no, hold on, excuse me, whoa, whoa, no. He dominated the game. Don't get me wrong. 70 yards rushing, led his, his, his attack on that. Uh, two touchdowns, 265 yards, the one INT. But I mean, he had Michael DeCroce come back. I mean, Michael DeCroce coming back for Mac is, to put it in relative terms, is like Batman controlling Gotham City. And all of a sudden, Superman shows up and be like, yo, I think I want to just, you know, take care of business here with you. Like, that's clean streets in Gotham right now. And that's what Mac is doing. They're cleaning up on other teams. DeCroce. Uh, you know, what can you say? Guy comes back, he's so dangerous, uh, over 100 yards passing, and he just steps right back in. The biggest thing about this win is Mac is efficient when they have the ball. Their defense steps up for them, and that's where he controlled the game, really. Mac gets it done on offense. With the, you know, they had, what, fewer first downs than uh, than Guelph in the, in the game, fewer possession, everything else. I mean, Guelph, statistically, if you look at the game, you go, Shoot, how is it this lopsided? And it's because Jazz Lindsay, when it came down to it, threw those picks. And if you can't get uh, any offense going with the offense you already have going, you're going to lose, especially against a juggernaut like Mac. Well, speaking does that make of any juggernaut, sense at the end? I, I don't think that made sense. Do you, do, you, do you know what I meant, though, you? <laughs> I, I, the juggernaut makes the most sense with Mac. And now we're going on to another juggernaut winning another Dunsmore Cup with the Laval Rougeor 
defeating the Sherbrooke Verde or 40 to 17. And this game it was close for a minute. I was following along so as I was streaming online. Mo Khan was with the call of the game, and it's 16 10. And then I turn off my phone and I look back, and, and all of a sudden the game's over. Yeah, Laval, their ability That's... to steamroll teams is just they're sneaky good. That's what they do. Balanced attack. If there's one player on that team that you can go, yeah, that's that's the absolute star of this team. There's not. There's five, maybe. You know, four, five, six, who knows? They're so balanced when it comes to offense and defense that that's how they win games. You know, they are maybe one of the most boring teams to watch in the CIS at times. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but they are efficient. And they get it done when they have to get it done. They get stops when they got to get stops. They get big plays when they got to get big plays. The only thing about this game that really disappointed me the most was I don't think we got the Dunsmuir Cup that we needed. I, I really wanted Montreal Laval. I wanted to see the Caribans come back and, uh, and and try to you know try to get the Rouge Or on their home field, uh, on the Rouge Or's home field. And and you know I just I I just don't feel like we get. And JP Schwarze is gonna. Curse me out for saying this because he was so excited about his very or making it uh, to the Dunsmore. But everybody knew. We all knew it wasn't going to happen. And it didn't happen. Very or can't stomp down the, you know, beast of the East that is Laval. I, I think we would have got a better game if it was Montreal. But, you know, at this point it's irrelevant. So Laval wins, what, their, what is this, 10th straight? Some of that? It's, uh, straight I believe, yeah, I believe it. Since they started dominating at Peps and Peps turned into that atmosphere, they haven't lost. So I believe it's about 10 straight. So, you know, dynasty? Hmm, I wonder. <laughs> you know, a little bit. Like, I, I, don't get me wrong. I, I, I think that uh, Laval probably would have beaten Montreal as well. But I just think we would have got a little bit of a better game. I agree. It's very hard to, especially when Laval gets at home field, it's very hard to beat them. And I'm listening yeah. to the game, and it's midway through the first quarter. And I believe they went, they hadn't attempted a run play yet. And I'm like, oh, Laval, they're just going to try and throw the ball and air it out. And then you look at the end of the game, net rushing, 309 yards. So that's without uh, without rushing in the first quarter they did that. So <laughs> pick your poison with them. Yeah, well, two guys rushing for over 100 yards in the game as well. You know, and only one of them scoring a touchdown, you know, out of 25 attempts. I mean, you know, when you've got, when you're, when you're averaging, Close to 20 yards per rush with Maxime Boutin did. And I think I might have uh, uh, butchered his name there. But uh, yeah, I'm getting better at the French names, by the way. But, uh, you know, just when I'm doing the highlights portion on the on the TV show. Got Jim Mullen coaching me through there and J.P. Chouare as well. But that being said, you know, when you average 20 yards uh, per carry or per rush on six attempts, I mean, come on. Where's the defense there, right? So, I, like I said, I, I think we would have got a little bit of a better game. I think the Kerry Bands could have stepped it up, but the Kerry Bands didn't didn't play four quarters of football last week, and you know that's what turned them. Well, now Laval will be taking on the winner of the Loney Bowl, which is the Acadia Axemen, in one of the more. Whew, I'm trying to pick the next words. Right next words, probably Acadia winning 17 to nine. One of the harder games to watch for a view, from a viewer's perspective, just to give you some stats on the game. They <laughs> Mayor completing one pass for negative five yards. It was a shovel pass, and it was fumbled and set up an Acadia field goal. So just putting that into perspective of what kind of game this was, Acadia will now travel to Laval. Take us through that game. <laughs> Take us through it. Jeez. I think you just did. <laughs> I mean, Jean Legault with his ponytail. I mean, you thought he was going to be like Steven Seagal out for justice. But, uh, yeah, anyone? Anyone? Tough crowd here. No. <laughs> no I'll tell you what, minus five passing says everything for for Jean Legault's game. Uh, the Axemen shut it down. That's what they do. They shut them down. Uh, it's a lopsided conference. We saw it in the championship game. Um, you know, AUS Rookie of the Year, Thomas Troop, what, 181 yards on the ground? You know, Graves yeah. wasn't great, but, he, you know, he didn't have to be really almost. You know, I mean, if you got the other team, would, you know, I, I personally, I just saw the highlights of the game. I, that wasn't a game that uh, I was going to sit down and, and, and endure four quarters of. Uh, and from what you're telling me, they're skipping more passes than, than guys are dropping. So, you know, they, they got some serious work to do at SMU. The conference has got some serious work to do. We talked about it off air before uh, before we lit this thing up and, you know, what do you do really, right? What do you just say, oh, well, you know, this is second-tier football and we make another tier? You can't do that. 
You know, it's still a legitimate conference. There's still legitimate schools. I mean, they had legitimate histories, but at this point, you know, there's only one school in the whole conference, and that's Acadia. And you know, they won. I'm surprised they only won 17 to nine. To be honest with you. I know. St. Mary's I defense be- is very is very strong, but uh, again, there's only so much they could do. And now yeah. Acadia traveling to Laval, and we'll start up with our bowl our bowl previews. Last time they played there, Acadia put up a bit of a fight. Laval was in a bit of flex as they fired, removed, he stepped down, whatever yeah. happened yeah. there. And Laval, their offensive coordinator, they had a new one. Since then, they've been rolling. Acadia. Key player I'm saying right now for the Axemen is Brett Backman. They're strong side. Last year, if you remember, Acadia couldn't cover any deep throws to the wide side of the field. Yeah, uh, it's going to be a tough one for Acadia. And then, you know, um, you know, if you're going to look at predictions for this one, I'm going to say Laval in a, in, in a walk. You know, I don't think it's going to be uh, nearly as close. You know, it could be close early on. But once that machine starts going – and once the Rouge or get going and once the crowd gets behind them, it's, a, like you said, very tough environment to win in. Um, I'm going to take Laval easily in this one, maybe two to three scores uh, differential. It'll be interesting to see what the what the predictions come out of the CIS blog. The CIS blog.ca has a metric that comes out for their spreads. And I don't think, in talking to the editor of the site, I don't think they'll be very favorable of Acadia in that one. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they get if they put it in the 30s. If you want to roll some serious dice, take, I don't know, a few thousand dollars down to your bookie and uh, and put it on Acadia. And, and <laughs> you know, you get a return on that, even just the cover. I mean, the spread's going to have to be 14 at least. But it'll yeah, be, you it'll, never know. It'll, it'll, now, the big game is the Mitchell Bowl, and we've talked about this uh, past times, and everyone who seems I've talked to on this show has said, can't wait for that Mitchell Bowl, McMaster Calgary. This is the ne- this is the Vanier Cup right here, and now mm-hmm. he played in Hamilton. Who do you have in this one? What do you have? What can you tell us about Calgary getting psyched up for this one? Well, I'll tell you what. How how excited can you know can you be now as a, as a CIS football fan? This is what it all comes down to right now. You know, you finally get to see you know the beast of the east, uh, or maybe you know maybe not the east east because I, I gave that name already to Laval. So let's say the beast of Ontario. Uh, play against the beast of the of the West in in, in Calgary. Uh, do I don't I I don't personally believe that this is the Vanier Cup. I really actually think that Laval will give either team, uh, Mac or Calgary, um, a, a better game. Uh, I basically put it this way: if Laval makes it to a Vanier Cup, I think they rightfully deserve to be there. That's what I'm saying. Um, mm-hmm. But Calgary, as much as I've seen them this year, they got a real serious swagger. It's almost um, it's almost a chip on their shoulder, and I wonder if it's going to come back to bite them because if you watch the game, especially in the fourth quarter when it started to get away from the Rams, Dolesky and a few other guys waving at, at, at the Rams, you know, real cocky kind of stuff, shouting at them. I know it's heat of the moment. I know it's, you know, you're about to win your fifth straight, Hardy. But, uh, you know, I, I think you really got to control that, though. You know, you can't be looking yourself in the mirror and, and you know, thinking that you're you're the you're the you know what I mean. Um, you know, you got to come in, you got to prepare, you got to be ready. Uh, and this Calgary team has a lot of weapons. They're very deep, and they could beat Mac. They could, but they got to come in with the right mentality, and they got to make sure that uh, that swagger uh, doesn't spill over into cockiness. And um, they got to be prepared right off the hop. I think one of the things that you can do to Mac early is is you can get on Kyle Quinlan early. And people are like, "What are you talking about?" I mean, they just won 20 straight wins behind this guy. But hear me out here. You know, he's been average in early games recently. And you know, my 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 uh, well, right now my colleague. Uh, Billy Green, who's been helping us on uh, a Crown Canadian University countdown over the last uh, few episodes here, we spoke about it um, last week, and and he he said it himself. You know, Kyle did not look like Kyle, and I think if Calgary can really set a tone and get in there, and it's going to be a tough environment to come into, especially when you're the team coming from out west, you're going to have little to none support. You're going to be walking into a lion's den, right? But uh, Calgary does, like I said, they have that swagger. They've got that cockiness that if they control that properly, they might be able to get on to Mac early. And if they get on to Mac early, that I think is going to be the key uh, to them trying to pull out a victory. However, I am uh, I am a smart man when it comes to betting. I'm not a smart man in a lot of things, but in life, I'm a smart man when it comes to betting. And smart money tells me that uh, you put it on Mac. 
Well, just to, to reiterate your point, you remember last year in the eighth cup, Western was up early on Mac because Quinlan was struggling. Quinlan ended up taking, takes over, wins the game. Acadia exactly. up early, Quinlan struggling. Same thing happened. So definitely yep. he struggles to want to get set in, but once he does, he takes over. And that's and that's the key right there. And I think uh, out of those two teams that you just described, they're not Calgary though, right? I think they did. Western or Acadia had the depth that Calgary has on both sides of the ball. Um, you know, Calgary's a lot like Mac if you look at them and you, you line up the, the two rosters and you compare the statistics and whatnot. I mean, you know, killer quarterbacks, uh, just amazing depth in the wide receivers, uh, linebackers that just, you know, murder the run. Uh, and then, of course, uh, you know, the, the one side that Calgary really has, uh, Mac is uh, in running back with Stephen Lombala, who, you know, probably would have been the uh, Heck Creighton Award uh, nominee out of the Canada West if it wasn't, you know, for his re- uh, roommate, <laughs> teammate. I don't know if they're roommates. Uh, the teammate, uh, Eric Dulesky, who, uh, and then, of course, Lombala had to uh, miss a game this season due to injury. But, um, you know, on the ground game, you've got to give it to Calgary. But everywhere else, if you look at them and you weigh them out, uh, I think you'll find that they probably come up uh, about 50 50. It'll be really interesting in that game, and I'm really excited for that. That that'll be the second game. The first game, 1 p.m. Eastern, will be the Utah Bowl. The Mitchell Bowl will be showed directly after. Those are both on TSN. And you have something interesting to tell us, Andrew, about what's happening, the advances with the Canadian Countdown. What yep. advancements do you have to tell us about? Well, we've gone from strength to strength now with Crown Canadian University Countdown. Of course, picking up the the good people, David Dubay, uh, and the good people at Crown Produce out uh, in Saskatchewan as our title sponsor. We've also picked up another sponsor in Russell Athletic who have been helping us and presenting us. Uh, all our playoff uh, uh, highlights have been featured uh, courtesy of Russell. We are moving forward to finish off the season. We've added an extra episode. So we are going to do a final episode uh, after the Vanier Cup, which we didn't do in our season one last year. And we're going to really open things up in this episode, get all our people that uh, have helped us out, um, you know, with interviews, of course, JP Chouare from Acrofoot.com has been on every episode for us. He's our, he's our guy out east, gives us, you know, great insight from the AUS and the Q. Donovan Bennett from The Score, uh, you know, our OUA insider. Uh, you, of course, you mentioned him earlier, Andrew Buckholz from Yahoo Sports, who, uh, you know, is just uh, keyed in when it comes to football in Canada, whether it's uh, from the junior level, CIS level, uh, straight up to the pros in the CFL. And uh, Billy Green, of course, um, from the UBC Thunderbirds, who, you know, has played his final uh, game as a Thunderbird. Uh, he's helped us out as well. So that final episode, we're kind of going to get everybody in there. We're going to have a big talk, me, myself, Jim Mullen. Uh, me, myself, I said myself twice. Uh, <laughs> Ryan Sullivan. <laughs> so that'll be our final episode. Uh, well, And we'll do that one right after the Vanier Cup. And, of course, you can catch us in most markets across Western Canada um, on Shaw, just check your local listings there. And then, like you said earlier, um, in Kingston on Kojiko in the Ontario area. And then, of course, on YouTube, just uh, just search Crown Canadian University Countdown. But the, the, the news that I'm getting to um, is that next season we are hoping to put a French edition of the show together. And, of course, uh, it's in its infant stages. We're just talking about it right now. Uh, J.P. Choire from Aquafoot uh, would be a big part of that. Uh, so we're hoping to do that next year. And we know the audience is huge out uh in Quebec, um, I mean, like I was saying to you earlier, I, I think you could probably just do a RSEQ uh, highlight show and, and get a great audience for it. But hopefully we'll be able to put that together for next season. And, of course, season three uh, will start up with the CIS uh, season next year. But, um, you know, it's just been another great year of CIS football, and, and we're really happy and excited uh, to present it to everybody, uh, not only across Canada, but like we said, across, around the world but through uh, YouTube and any CIS fans that might be out and who knows, Tel Aviv or something can uh, check out how their marauders are doing or see how uh, their dinos are doing or whoever they support. So it's a fantastic, uh, exciting time for CIS football, and, it, and it's exciting for us because um, we're really starting to see a lot of people and a, a lot of great response from people. And, you know, it's great for university sport in Canada, and it's great for amateur sport in Canada. I completely agree with that. It's nice to see the, the highlights across the board being shown in one format. Usually only get one minute to see it every week. With you guys, we get a whole show, and it's very exciting and very promising to see the future of CIS football continue to grow. Yeah, and, you know, we, we we bring the light side of things into it as well. I mean, if anyone who's watched the show, especially last week's episode where uh, we did a little play on Jim Mullen, who is uh, 
who's kind of like our uh he's kind of like Ryan and my like dad basically you know he kind of uh, sets us straight and and of course we like to rip on him but like I said we do it all in good fun we try to bring some humor into everything and, and you know lighten it up because at the end of the day yeah it's sports but it, you know if we take it too seriously then you know what's the fun in it right exactly it's just a game and some people like it it can get lose sight of that yeah exactly <laughs> thank you so much Andrew for joining us. I'm Kevin Garbuli, and this is another edition of CIS Talk on Rouge Radio. Hey, you. Yeah, you with that sandpaper and paintbrush getting ready to sand and paint that wooden fence again this year when you could be sitting back, relaxing on your patio, and watching your neighbors do that work. Get rid of that wood fence and easily install a new low-maintenance resin fence that lasts. Visit Keter.com. K-E-T. E-R dot com for videos, product information, and more. You can find this fence at some Costco's across North America and always at Costco.ca with shipping right to your door. Ketter.com. It's time for RougeRadio.com's final Canadian Junior Football League report of the season. I'm Josh Aldridge and joined once again by John DiNapoli. And John, what a way to go out. That was a terrific Canadian bowl in Langley and look for the longest... Lo- longest time like we might have a major upset on our hands but the Saskatoon Hilltops managed to pull out the 23-21 win for their third straight national championship and record 16th overall. Yeah Josh yeah we couldn't ask for anything more in a Canadian final and some of us thought it was going to be a a one-sided affair and uh, I'm glad for the people in attendance and the people that watched it on uh, on TV and on the internet that uh, they were uh, treated to a a well played game, uh, 23-21, the final score for the Saskatoon Hilltops, and um, it started out uh, very slow for both teams after a scoreless first quarter. Uh, the Langley Rams uh, broke the tie just a uh, buck 36 into the second quarter as uh, quarterback Greg Bocott uh, hooked up with Malcolm Williams on a 16-yard touchdown strike. Uh, however, the Hilltops would come right back on their next drive and they finished it off with a Zach Schmidt uh, 18-yard field goal and it cut the lead to 7-3. Uh, about eight minutes later, Schmidt again would kick a field goal, this time from 32 yards out, and uh, the defending champs were within one and um, looked like the game might have been slipping away from uh, the Rams at this point. Uh, but just before the half, uh, Bocott uh, would connect with uh, Michael Patko for a 73-yard catch and run uh, for a touchdown and uh, the lengthy receiver broke a couple of tackles on the way into the end zone. Uh, with 2.18 to go in the quarter. and uh, There we are at the half in, in Langley, and it's uh, the Rams leading the Hilltops uh, 14-6. And I know you were a little shocked, and I was a little shocked uh, uh, seeing 14-6 at the half, but um, give the Rams credit for uh, taking the lead and, and taking the game to the Hilltops, not uh, allowing them to establish the run and, and uh, keeping the quarterback, um, Matt Karpinka, on his, uh, on his toes for much of the first half. Uh, four minutes into the third quarter, however, uh, the Rams – Running back Daniel Xavier would uh, punch in another one and extended the lead to 21-6, and uh, crowds going wild, and then it thinks like they might be able to uh, to ride out a victory here. Uh, however, Nick Downey on the next uh, Rams possession uh, fumbled and completely changed the momentum of this game as Michael Waldron uh, recovered the fumble and uh, returned to the five-yard line, uh, setting up an Andre Lawan uh, five-yard uh, touchdown run on the next play, and it cut the lead to 21-13. Uh, where it stood after three quarters. Um, then we get into the fourth quarter, and Zach Schmidt uh, connects on his third field goal of the game from 30 yards out, and uh, it's 21-16 at this point. And you could just see the uh, momentum has been drained out of the Rams, and um, the game is now the momentum uh, totally shifted over to uh, the Hilltops, and uh, they didn't let the inexperience of the big game or anything get to them, and uh, they were able to complete the quarter comeback when uh, Matt Karpinka found uh, Graham Unruh for a 40-yard catch and run, and uh, was the Hilltops' first lead of the game, and, the, and they would not relinquish that uh, on their way to their third straight Canadian championship, uh, 23-21, uh, the final score in Langley. Talked about this last week, heading into this game. Uh, the uh, the Rams would really have to play great defense to kind of keep this close. So it really seems kind of what what happened there. Just kind of kept the defending champs or the eventual champs just kind of at bay for a while. But just it seemed like it just kind of slipped away from there eventually. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I look at the stats and and Graham Munru, you know, six catches for a game high, two hundred eighteen yards in the touchdown, named offensive player of the game. Um, you know, other than that, you look at the offensive stats and they were pretty much able to corral the offense. And, 
you know, you look at the stats and they, they had 434 yards. It, you know, Saskatoon turns the ball over uh, four interceptions on a day. And, and I thought Langley played really good defense. Uh, I mean, they got gouged at times for yardage, but they didn't really give up a lot of points and it kept them in the game. Uh, Andre Lalonde, the big running back for, for the Hilltoppers, you know, 23 carries for 112 yards. And that was a little over four yards a carry, uh, four and a half yards a carry. So, you know, they were able to keep him in check. You go look at the wide receivers, other than the six catches by by Grant, there was only uh, three other guys that caught balls. Uh, you know, John Trumpy had three for 47 yards, and, and again, they were kept in check as well. So, um, you know, four interceptions on the day, uh, one trick play, they got him 71 yards on a pass from uh, John Trumpy to, to Graham Unruh. And, you know, other than that, I thought uh, Langley had a great game plan, and they were just able, not able to capitalize on, on, on the four interceptions as best they could, or the turn, turning point, like I said, was the fumble, and um, good teams find a way to win, and uh, it's a great learning experience for Langley, Langley and hopefully uh, they can come back and use that experience next year in the, in the Canadian Bowl final, if they can make it that far. Absolutely, that, that experience is all important. Again, another thing we kind of talked about last week was that experience. They looked a little edgy. Uh, coming in, they they weren't really all that sharp early on. Uh, Langley was neither offense was really all that sharp. I'm not sure what was going on with uh, uh, with Saskatoon early on, but they eventually got it going. Both teams eventually got it going, but they just kind of seemed a little unnerved. And then when they got that took that big punch from uh, from from the Hilltops with that turnover that turned into six points there in the in the third quarter. That 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 just really kind of set them back, and they didn't really seem to know how to respond to that. Again, a young, really young, talented team in Langley, and they should, they, they will learn from this, and they should move on, and they should be back in this kind of position uh, next year. Uh, what, what really struck you about this game? Well, we had previewed, and, and you had predicted uh, a Nick Downey touchdown somewhere along the line, and um, you know, looking at the stats of the game on, on special teams. I thought Saskatoon did a real good job of keeping Nick Downey in bay. He had four punt returns for 63 yards with a 26-yard long, and um, he had one kickoff return for 23 yards. And they did a great job of neutralizing uh, the return game of Nick Downey and that of Langley. And, um, you know, we don't give special teams as much credit as as we'd like at times, but uh, I got to give credit to the uh, to the Saskatoon kicking game and and their ability to cover the punts and and cover Nick Downey. We know he's the most explosive guy returning kicks in in Canadian Junior Football history, and uh, they did a real nice job bottling up on the day. And I, you know, it was a real great defensive effort by them on that way. And um, you know, defensive player of the game, Dylan Kemp, uh, 11 solo tackles, setting a Canadian Bowl record. Uh, for 22 defensive points, so it was a it was a great team effort, and, and we got to give the special teams the credit that it deserves of bottling up uh, a real superstar like Nick Downey on the day. And you mentioned that kicking game. Zach Schmidt had a pretty good game kicking the ball, uh, 290 yards on eight kicks, uh, 46 yard was as long, and then on field goals he hit he was three for three. None of them were overly long. The longest 32. But each one of those were critical. If he'd missed one of those, well, they're not winning their their third straight championship. And just his uh, kicking, his punting, keeping uh, uh, Downey off to the sidelines and bottling them up, so critical, so critical. And Downey was a little bit of a disappointment. I, I think we expected quite a bit more out of him in this game. And you mentioned earlier he had that big fumble that led to the uh, t- first touchdown for the Hilltops that got them going. So I think he'll bounce back. Heck of a talent. Uh, and he's got a few more years left in him in this league. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how he bounces back. It was more than just the game on the weekend. Uh, there, there were awards handed out at the annual banquet beforehand. And uh, as they also unveiled their all-Canadian teams. We're going to start with the Gord Curry uh, Coach of the Year, and that goes to uh, John Vuvalaitis of the London Bee Feeders. Uh, they finished seven and one in Ontario Football Conference uh, championships for the first time in their history. Uh, Rookie of the year went to uh, running back Jordan Samol of the Edmonton Wildcats. Uh, the Peter Dalla Riva outstanding offensive player, no no shock here in Jordan Yance of the Vancouver Island Raiders. The Larry Rock outstanding defensive player of the year. Um, I don't think it's much surprise here that Will Gandarevo, the uh, San Leonard Cougars with uh, 19 tackles and 15 sacks on the year. Uh, the CGFL Pass Commissioner's Award went to Ben White of the Okanagan Sun. CGFL Stuart McDonald Executive of the Year went to George Thompson of the London Bee Feeders. 
Uh, the CGFL Life Member Award uh, went to Blake Roberts of the Okanagan Sun. Now for the All-Canadian teams. Uh, on the offensive line, you have Nathan uh, Caranacci of the London Bee Feeders, Anthony Daly of the Langley Rams, uh, Frank Pellegrino of the Calgary Colts, Matt uh, Leung of the Saskatoon Hilltops, and Tyler Oldendorf of the Vancouver Island Raiders. At receiver, we have Anthony Pizzuti of the Hamilton Hurricanes, Whitman Tamuziak of the Vancouver, Vancouver Island Raiders, Kyle McGinnis of the Saskatoon Hilltops, and Brett Carter of the Winnipeg Rifles. At running back, we have Greg Morris of the West Shore Rebels and Jordan Samol of the Edmonton Wildcats. Uh, the quarter of, quarterback, of course, is Jordan Yance of the Vancouver Island Raiders. Uh, the punter is Quinn Van Gliswick of the West Shore Rebels. And, of course, the place kicker, uh, no surprise here, uh, Zach Medeiros of the London Bee Feeders. On defense, uh, defensive line, uh, CGFL Defensive Player of the Year, Wogan Darabo of the St. Leonard Cougars, uh, Evan Foster of the Langley Rams, uh, Donovan Dale of the Saskatoon Hilltops, uh, Stephen Doidge of the Okanagan Sun. At linebacker is Adam Grill from the Hamilton Hurricanes, uh, Adam Konar of the Langley Rams, and Stephen Baranuski of the Calgary Colts. Uh, defensive backs are Neil Riley Grant of the Brampton Bears, Tremaine Apperly of the Vancouver Island Raiders, Adam Lawrence of Adam Edmonton Wildcats, uh, Ian Berry of the London Beef Eaters, and Jermaine Gabriel of the Calgary Colts. Uh, your return specialty, of course, return specialist is uh, Nick Downey of the Langley Rams. So uh, it's a real impressive list. Uh, you can tell who uh, the teams that are well represented in the uh, in the Jostens Cup and. Uh, uh, the uh, BCFC uh, semifinals and the Canadian Bowl uh, well represented here on the uh, all Canadian first teams, uh, all Canadians, and very impressive list of players. And uh, that list is going to be losing a lot of guys, but there's still a lot of great talent coming back. So, uh, looking forward to some great things from these uh, returning players next year. Absolutely. A- any kind of uh, I-, I guess snubs or players that you thought, oh, geez, maybe he should have deserved an extra look there. Well. Look, the one that really stands out, and being an AKO Fratman, and, and I'm gonna uh, two AKO Fratman guys that uh, kind of get omitted from this because they kind of don't qualify because they weren't all conference players. But uh, I think uh, uh, our linebacker Mason Picos can play up right up with them with the uh, three guys that were there. Uh, I know that you got to have one from every uh, conference there, uh, but I, I know one that's kind of if we were player three four and it was the extra linebacker in a box. Uh, I think Mason Bekos would be a great call there. And, and punting wise, uh, Quinn Van Glitswick for West Shore Rebels was the All Canadian punter. And I look at his numbers and I look at the AQ punter uh, uh, Dan Colella, and, and his average was uh, probably six yards more per punt. But uh, uh, Zach Medeiros was both the place kicker and the punter in the OFC, so you know Dan doesn't qualify for All Canadian, but. Uh, you know, that one omission uh, kind of sticks with me, uh, knowing that uh, the punter with the AQL frab and was about uh, six more yards per average and, and punted uh, uh, quickly about 20 more times for the season. So uh, that one was a little shock, but uh, congratulations to Quinn, Quinn Van Glisswick on uh, being the All-Canadian punter. Kind of the one that really stands out to me that kind of got overlooked uh, on the All Canadian team, uh, VI Raider. Although they had a lot of, uh, they had four players overall on the two teams. Uh, Dylan Shaftelain, uh their outstanding linebacker, uh, he was a unanimous selection to the BCSC uh, All All or the All BCSC team, and uh, didn't get mentioned here at all in the All Canadian list. So a little bit surprising there. His his stats uh, uh, were quite were quite a bit better than Adam Conar, who also ended up as the BCFC defensive player there. Still an outstanding player, but a little bit surprising to see uh, to, to see no mention of uh, Shot Delane there. Uh, now, the other kind of big buzzword this weekend, uh, there's a bit of discussion uh, about expansion. Now, do you think the, the uh, CGFL is something that or is ready to expand? Do you think the, the game is ready to see more CGFL teams across the country? Or there's pockets where you see where the game is really kind of set to explode or that there should be more representation there? Well, you hit it there with the latter statement about pockets of uh, parts of Canada that uh, – can uh, withstand uh, expansion. I think in the OFC, uh, you know, the five-year plan as of June 2011 was to expand to 12 teams uh, in the next five years. And uh, at this particular moment, uh, 
as you know some feelers out from some towns in in, in Ontario. But the problem is in Ontario is is like we said last week, the financial uh, aspect of the game just isn't there yet. So when you're expanding into markets that maybe financially can't withstand a junior football team, because it really is is a big time expense, and you got to be able to have a budget of you know about a hundred thousand to to really compete on nationally, and uh, that's one of the problems we have in Ontario. You get into the B, uh, the PFC. Um, and you got six teams, so you, you're trying to find two to make it an even eight. And uh, you know, Fort McMurray's name is brought out quite a bit. Uh, about uh, you know, they're looking to expand into that into that market. And, I, mean, I mean, if they could find another one, whether it's in, in Manitoba or you know Saskatchewan, somewhere along the lines, but they already got two teams. So um, I think expanding in, in pockets of Canada, I, I'd like to really see the league go east more than anything outside of. Uh, you know, Quebec East, we got Montreal with St. Leonard Cougars, but uh, I'd love to see the CGFL expand to possibly an Atlantic League uh, to get into our umbrella with the CGFL and really make it a coast-to-coast league instead of, you know, central on, you know, central Canada from Ontario West. You know, how do you prove it's a Canadian championship when half the country, pretty much, you know, a third of the country isn't playing in the Canadian Junior Football League? So I'd really like to see the league expand east. Uh, and then the pockets of Alberta that could probably withstand a team uh, and, and expand this league even more. I remember the days when it was 27, 28 teams in the Canadian Football League, and I, I'd really like to see it get back up there. And it's a great alternative. We, we've uh, heard for years and years how the game's exploding in places like Quebec, but it comes down to is, is there enough money and desire to build CFL stadiums in places like Quebec City or in the Maritimes this is a great alternative to that. A lot of the infrastructure is already in place for uh, for CJFL franchises, but it's a matter of just kind of getting that word out there a little bit more, I think. I agree totally. Out in Halifax and St. John's and, and, out, in the, and out east, I mean, they host a couple of CFL games the last couple of years, and it's proven that they have the stadiums and the infrastructure there to, you know, withstand a, you know, a football program like that. Whether the community wants to sit there and back you know 18 to 22 year olds uh, for football like they do for hockey out there uh, it would it'd be like nice to see i really would uh one of the competing factors in the in the province of quebec is is cjep there which is kind of just a i don't want to say a continuation of high school but it kind of takes into consideration the grade 12 13 first year out of you know high school league which is supposed to be what pretty much the cjfl is supposed to be but they have their cjep league where you know, a lot of great talent comes out of that league, and, and they use that as a stepping stone to get their NCA scholarships and stuff. And uh, I know a lot of players that have played at Michigan over the years, uh, the Kashama brothers and stuff, and Shimonga Biaka Batuka that played in the NFL that were uh, uh, CJEP players out of View Montreal. I'd really love to see them play in the CJFL before going, you know, to the NCA, but uh, that's their choice. And I'd really like to see the Quebec really get a league back the way they had uh, back in the 80s and uh, early 90s when, you know, the Quebec province had their own uh, version of Canadian junior football. You mentioned it used to be at 27 teams across the country. Do you see the CJFL coming back to that? Do you see the, the sport growing? I don't, you know, that's a tough one, Josh. You know, I don't see how you can possibly get more teams in, in the markets we have already. You know, there's a lot of teams in Ontario that are fledging right now because of the financials. So it's not about, you know, right now in Ontario, it's not about expansion or Canadian football expanding. I think we got to just I'll strengthen, especially in Ontario, the teams that we have. And if we can get the infrastructure in place uh, locally uh, and make these teams stronger financially, uh, then you can start to expand and, and, and make each you know league better. Unfortunately, the money ain't there in Ontario right now, and you can't find the corporate backing to you know support these great teams. And it's unfortunate, but uh, we go with what we got. And I, I'd really like to see the league get up to 30 teams. There, I think there's enough cities in this to, in this great country of ours that play football that we should have 30 plus teams uh playing junior football uh there's 20 teams in the in the ontario hockey league and you know 20 more you know you got the quebec league and you got the western league there's enough if we can support you know 60 plus junior hockey teams why can't we support 30 uh junior football teams in this country and, and i really like to see the uh you know the, the backing of, of the population of canada get behind football as much as they do the hockey because we really do play some great football you know bigger fields uh bigger ball you know, a tougher game to play than, than the American style at times. And, uh, you know, it, it's it, it's something that this this Canadian Junior Football League would nearly needs to uh, assess whether, you know, expansion is the right way to go. And if it is the right way to go, make sure we find the markets that uh, can sustain, sustain the, 
you know, financially a big uh, uh, product of the TGFL. Any last thoughts for the year Ed, before we head off into into the sunset, I guess, into the into the off season, into the winter? Uh, and any final thoughts on the year uh, and kind of looking forward to next year? Absolutely. Uh, you know, you know, starting out west, uh, everybody thought Vancouver Island was going to come out of the BCSC, and, and they were upset in the semifinals by a great Langley team, a great great host of the Canadian Bowl this past weekend, and uh, a little shock. Great, great for the BCFC that you know other teams are able to step up and win games. Uh, in, the, in the Prairie Football Conference, Calgary was ranked number one all year long and gets upset in the playoffs by Regina Thunders. Uh, so that was a, they were able to, you know, expand and, and, you know, when you get right down to it, you still got the big, big uh, Hilltops winning the nat- third straight national title, which, um, you know, shows their dominance over, you know, the last couple of years in 16 national titles. So it's good for that. In the Ontario Football Conference, you got the London Bee Feeders winning their first title ever. Uh, since their inception in 1975, so it's good for Ontario that it's not just always you know the Hamiltons, the Akeel Fratman, and, and and the St. Leonard Cougars winning all the time. So uh, it was great balance in the OFC this year. It was great balance in in, in the Prairie Football Conference after the Calgary Colts were eight and zero and stuff. So it, it's great. It, it looks you know the product on the field is outstanding, and, and it's only going to get better. These kids are going to get bigger, stronger, and faster in the off season. And, and I look for a lot of great things next year. Uh, out of the players returning, and, and there's a lot of them returning. You know, uh, a lot of great players that are, re- you know, uh, their time has come to an end, and they're going to be missed. Uh, a couple here in Windsor, um, so a couple of West that really stand out, like Jordan Yance's career in the Canadian Junior Football League has, has come to an end, and uh, you know, he's set a lot of records, and we tip our cap to him for for an outstanding performance. And it's one of those things that uh, it's sad to see him go into into the sunset for his Canadian Junior Football career, but it's it, it's five years is up, and uh, it's been a treat to watch a lot of great football this year. It's been a great to uh, be able to talk with you every week on this, and uh, uh, thank you to Rouge Radio for uh, giving me this opportunity this year to do, uh, to be able to speak my mind on Canadian Junior Football and, and recap what's happened in the, in the, in the CJFL. Uh, it's been great working with you, John. I couldn't put it much better myself about the season and what lays ahead for next year. I think there's a lot that's going to be turned over next year. There's going to be a lot of changes next year. It should be pretty exciting. And that will wrap up the final CJFL report of the season on RougeRadio.com. For John DiNapoli, I'm Josh Aldridge. Have a great winter, everybody.